welcome everyone to our celebration marking the publication of The Burden of Heritage by Aileen Allain. My name is Christina Whitf Perry and I'm Publishing Director for Confer and Karnak Books, the new publishing arm of Confer Limited. And it's my pleasure to welcome both our in-house and online audiences today. During the next hour, Aileen will be discussing her new book with Eugene Ellis, who is the author of The Race Conversation, published originally in 2021. And his book has recently been released in a new smaller format, marking the sales success of the original edition and aiming to reach an even wider audience. So just to tell you about the structure of the day, Eugene will introduce um, Aileen and I will shortly introduce Eugene. And then Aileen will facilitate a um, a brief ritual to remember our ancestors and which will be followed by a collective libation for which you have been given a small glass of liquid and um, please do not drink it before Aileen tells you in what manner we will be taking this libation um, and then we'll have a very um, informative and probably lovely conversation between the two authors Eugene and Aileen and finally Q&A from the audience, both online and in the room. And afterwards, in the bookshop, there will be book signing and a celebratory Guyanese culinary treat, as well as snacks and drinks. And maybe even some dancing, is that right? <laughs> and I just wanted to say a few words before introducing Eugene. Um, the Confer and Karnak publishing has been going for about two and a half years now. And you see before you two of my very first author commissions. Um, so both of these books and these authors are very special to me. And Eugene's book, The Race Conversation, and The Burden of Heritage by Aileen are both dealing with the generational trauma that has been taken on board through a historical enslavement of African and Caribbean peoples. And I think that what they have been able to do in their books is to give people not an opportunity to understand how this impacts on people's lives. And also, I think it brings to light other burdens that we carry. And that it's not just heritage in a particular context, but heritage generally that can be burdensome. And that is what psychotherapy can help us to carry those burdens. Maybe not to put them down, but to lighten the load. So I give you Eugene, who is, um, as well as the author of The Race Conversation, a psychotherapist and the founder of the Black African and Asian Therapy Network. Um, a network of therapists committed to passionate and actively engaged in addressing the psychological needs of black African and South Asian people in the UK. And Eugene has worked for many years with severely traumatized children and their families in the field of adoption and has a special interest in body oriented therapies and facilitating a dialogue around race and mental well-being through articles, podcasts, blog posts and his books. So, um, Eugene, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Aileen is a UKCP registered psychodynamic psychotherapist, clinical supervisor and organizational consultant in the UK. She lectures at several training institutions and is a consultant on issues of race and cultural diversity to private organizations and statutory bodies, such as the NHS, social services, education and the police services. Her clinical research examining black workers experiences it in three institutional settings, makes a significant contribution to the discourse on race, highlighting the concept of the internal oppressor. It offers ways of deepening understanding of black psychological reactions to the, the negative impacts of racism. Ailing is the author of several book chapters and uh, journal publications, exploring themes on black-white dynamics, shame and identity wounding, and working with issues of difference and diversity in the, way, in the workplace. So, and I'm sure I could, we could go on. But uh, no. that's enough. <laughs> uh, we were talking about what we were going to do today. And yes. this idea of the ancestors and honouring the ancestors mm. came mm. up very strongly. And um, mm. I just thought, well, in the context mm. of burden of heritage, 
you know, we're standing on the shoulders yes. of others. So, yes. so, and I know you have um, yes. something prepared <laughs> for us around that. So I'm going to hand over to you. Honouring our ancestors can help us to feel grounded in our own histories and the music will help uh, generate a lovely atmosphere. Uh, it's, this is a ritual to reconnect with our ancestors. Um, but such a ritual also reminds us that we are connected through our ancestors to the rest of the web of life. We can begin to, to ask for their wisdom and they will begin to offer us guidance, helping us make better decisions to benefit the generations that are to come. And I can see a generation that is to come. Uh, I don't know how old she is, but she's nine. So, you know, we're talking about you too, uh, generations to come generations to come. Let us remember our ancestors in joy and sorrow. Let us remember what they have given us, what they have, what we have inherited from them, good, bad and indifferent. And when I'm talking here, I'm not talking about black ancestors, all, all our ancestors. We all have ancestors. So I, I invite you to think about your ancestors. Let us utilize the good for the advancement of all peoples, eradicate the bad that divide and destroy, and speak out and challenge the indifferent so that we can engage our true selves with the diversity of humanity. May they rest in peace let us hope that we will always have the resources we need so that our bodies, our minds can handle the work we are called upon to do, to repair, to heal and to grow. We ask for clear words, clear vision and clear purpose to do the work. And let us drink to them let us drink to them. Let us drink to them. To us and to future generations. Oh boy, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's good. Let's drink to them. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, do you do you have a, a, your drink? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. Okay. In uh, in Guyana, in the Caribbean, when uh, you do a libation, you pour some first on the ground, on the earth, but we can't afford to do that here. <laughs> so it's going in here. This is the earth. This is representative of the earth. And so uh, the candle is lit. The ancestors are well pleased. We have honored them. And uh, let's remember what we are taking from them, particularly the good because that makes us who we are, but also change what wasn't so good. Let's be proactive in changing what was not so good. And that's it for the ceremony uh, in remembering the ancestors. And we can move on. Right. Okay. Mm. Thank you. I, I haven't gone through everything, um, but I have sort of... Um, sort of gone through the book and I've just picked up on a few themes and uh, a few ideas and th some of some of which is very very exciting to me uh, but I wanted to start right from the very beginning um, right at the very beginning of the book you have this picture of a of a bird um, Kiskade 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 Kiskade, Kiskade yes, bird yes. Um, and you use it as a symbol throughout the book to kind of take a pause and this is trauma we're working with so mm. there's these occasional pauses um, you say a little bit about it in, in the book but I'm just mm. curious as to why that symbol? Why? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. If... Well, it's one of my favorite birds, the kiskadee, 
And if uh, we were lucky to have color, um, <laughs> uh, we, it, it, you would have seen that uh, it's a yellow bird. Um, it's a beautiful, bright yellow breasted bird. Uh, it's a native of South America and particularly Guyana. Um, and I've always been, I've always, I've always been interested in nature. And I loved that bird uh, above all birds. Um, and I loved the sound, the sound of the bird. My father tried to imitate, my late father tried to imitate the Kiskadi sound mm -hmm. as a way of calling mummy. So okay. he developed a whistle. Now, let me just see if I can do it. Okay. Something like. <laughs> and my mother would respond. <laughs> <laughs> and wherever they were in the house, <laughs> wherever, if he were downstairs, she was upstairs. Okay. That's nice. <laughs> and it sort of. Uh, mimic the sound of the kiskadi and the, fa mm. the fact that my father also um, uh, tried to imitate that. And I don't know if it's something, where it, you know, sort of imitating my father. I, I don't know. I don't mm. know. Mm. Mm. But you mentioned about the pause. Your book had, your book has mm. pause. It yes. indicates pause. And I thought, that's a jolly good idea. Okay. <laughs> But I didn't want to indicate where people paused in my chapter. Mm. I would prefer, and I mean, people can read however they want, mm. but if you can read an, an encapsulated chapter mm. and then take a rest, yes. take yes. a break, take, yeah. take a break. Yeah. Yeah. Because an encapsulated chapter creates continuity and congruence. You understand the whole concept within that chapter mm. so my father's whistle your mm -hmm. invention and something about me saying this book is about trauma yes. so yes. it's going to stir stuff up, stuff up. Mm. and i think if you want people to change you have to make them feel somewhat uncomfortable mm -hmm. and I mean that in with love mm -hmm. not vindictive uncomfortable but with love so the kiskadis mm. a mm. sort of a self-care thing mm. pause pause mm. pause mm. Mm. you'll have to tell me if I speak too much for one question because <laughs> probably I'm sure we're gonna get all the way through it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, uh, Starting off with the preface, you, 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 you talk about your first encounter with uh, a white couple. Uh, you were six years, six years old, mm -hmm. and you were in Guyana, of course. Um, um, and um, I, when, I, when I kind of heard that, I was thinking, well, actually, my experience is that you know, the white encounter was just there from the beginning. You know, it's like it was, there was no gap. Was you were, bo years, you were born, born here. You were born in the West. You were born here. If you're not born in the West, uh, uh, um, if you're not born in the West, there's a different experience. And I wondered if those mm. two different experiences show up in therapy, or if there's something, um, something there for the therapist to be uh, to take note of mm. in some way. Mm, that's a really, really interesting question. <laughs> I came to the UK when I had just turned 19. Hmm. So I would have, the first thing that comes to mind is schooling, my education. Hmm. That was in Guyana, the formative years was in Guyana. Hmm. And again, I'm thinking about this on my feet now. One of the things that I feel grateful for having been born there is I was taught Caribbean history West Indian history. Mm. And I am absolutely sure if I had my education in England, in the UK, mm. I would not have had that experience. And I'm just thinking now, what does having an education about the 
the place you were born, in this case, Guyana, the Caribbean, the, you know, the West Indies. Mm. I'm just wondering, what's the advantage in how that has made me who I am and how that influences my practice? Uh, I need to think more on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me ask you, I mean, um, <coughs> what, what, you, how, uh, you being born here, uh, and uh, has, have you missed out? Uh, does it, do you have an advantage uh, in, in therapy um, work? I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's an advantage one way or another. I think mm -hmm. it's just a different experience. A different I, I know, um, you know, people who've, mm. who've come from other countries and say, uh, there's a particular friend that mm. has come from Kenya, you know, relatively... Mm. In his twenties, sort of, mm -hmm. and um, you know, just has a very different experience of being in the UK. Mm -hmm. You feel they can just go anywhere. You, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go to the country, you can go here, you can go there, and go anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm very, you know, I'm, I've just got this wariness of moving out of London, moving into these other spaces. Oh. So there's, so there's, so there's that. And I, whether that shows up in therapy, I don't know. But, right, right. but there's something about, um, yeah, kind of having that very early experience, I guess, of being being seen, being observed, being, you know, the white mm, other, mm. Um, having that gaze on ah, you, which yes, kind of, yes, um, yes. which just gets in, in, in you in a way that you can't really see right. until, yes. uh, until maybe you're in your 20s or something, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. when you just try to work things out yes. for yourself. And I'm um, thinking, yeah. just following your lead, I didn't have that gaze, no. that white gaze, um, because I came here as I said, just as I just turned 19, yeah. I didn't have that gaze. So uh, you're making me think, did that, am I defended by the, the gaze, whatever, mm. uh, whatever is in that gaze? Am I, am I defended, protected, I mean, by right. that? Yes. Because yeah. I didn't have it and it hasn't mm, tainted me. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word. So it's formative years, isn't it? Formative very, years. Yeah, very, um, I, years. I don't know. I mean, yeah. this is a, quite a quite, this is an interesting question, folks, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, uh, this is a really interesting one. Yeah, I know. We, I know. We're just literally in page one of the book. Here, so. <laughs> but, but, but I, th I think yeah. what this is suggesting is somebody can write about that. Yeah, yeah. Somebody can write about that, and because we need to build the library of knowledge, somebody can write about that very same subject. Mm -hmm. Thank that, you for yeah, that. That's something palpable. I haven't, about I haven't answered it. Uh, no, no, no. I think <laughs> but it's, um... it's just got us thinking. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I was still in the early, early part of the book here. I think page two, maybe even three. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you talk about um, a, a conversation with your grandma, and um, you know, you're saying, oh, "I want to be an astronaut" or something. And uh, I won't say what she said. No, please do, because do everybody I? may not have read it. Um, well, I want them to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't exactly remember what it was, but whatever it was, no, anyway, whatever it was, um, I don't know the exact words, but it made me laugh. So that was, that was my first response. Um, and of course, to you as a child, it had a different, you know, it had it a was particular shaming. kind of shaming It impact. was shaming. But I remember laughing. I remember telling someone else about it, and they laughed. Mm. Um, but behind behind the laughter, there's this mm -hmm. there's there's this stuff, yes. isn't there? There's these limits to yes. there's these limits to your life. Mm. Mm. And um, but then I thought, oh, laughter! You know, that's such mm. a my family just so full of laughter. And I remember my therapy being quite full of laughter as well. Mm. Um, with a mm. black man, there was, and I just wondered about laughter. Mm. It's um, obviously it's double-edged. I'm sure there's mm. something about it which is mm. it is double-edged. Takes us through ad ad adversity, but it's also mm. hiding something. Mm. Um, you so are, you are some wonderful I, questions. Yeah, so, <laughs> we just, we've just literally yeah. started. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> these, I, these are where my mind goes when. <laughs> I must Maybe. put in context for those who haven't uh, read the the section that uh, Eugene's talking about. I remembered asking my uh, paternal grandmother. No, not asking. Say, telling, telling. I said to her, 
that I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, black people can't be astronauts. Their nostrils are too big and they'll use up too much oxygen or they'll use up all of the oxygen. That's what she said. And I mean, it is bloody funny, isn't it? It is funny. But a six-year-old child being told that, mm. it's a totally different experience. It's, it's a put-down. It's a criticism. Tell me what else a laugh like that uh, would engender in you. What else? What? Fear. 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 Sorry? Silencing. And shame. Oh, my goodness. Shock. 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 And restricted. Restricted. So uh, all of those, all of those, all of those emotions. A, ch a six-year-old six -year is just beginning to, to form their identity. And so that laughter was a form of ridicule. Uh, it was shaming. And so, but to answer your question, laughter is not just about that. Um, laughter is about release, release of pain. I remember going to see Maya Angelou, the late Maya Angelou, at the Lewisham Theatre. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I mean, the line snaked around the building. Mm -hmm. People were just really wanting to see this phenomenal woman. And I remember she recited a poem, because uh, she, she's a poet, amongst other things. And um, oh, I think I know the one. you know the poem yeah, yeah. when she talks about the woman <clears throat> sitting on a bus and she's laughing, but inside mm. she was crying. Mm. And we have an expression, which is quite, I think, a, a ubiquitous one. Uh, you know, uh, it's all over the, the, the place. Um, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And so laughter is about release of pain and, and, and discomfort. And so laughter is quite uh, multi-layered. But I tell you, when the, laugh, the ridicule laughter mm. is, when it's sounded in Guyana particularly, and I guess the rest of the Caribbean, you can be completely denuded. Mm. It literally strips you mm. of your mm. sense of self. Mm. It's really powerful. Yes, yes. Really powerful. Yeah. It's that sort of belly laugh, you know, yeah, yeah. but with like a who the hell do you think you are yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of thing, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, there, were, there, were some, there were some concepts uh, which really struck me and um, obviously hauntings of generational trauma and this concept of relational, so, uh, racial hauntings. Mm. Racial hauntings. When I heard that, I was just thinking, yeah, you know, I think I feel... I think I know what that is. I didn't really need to do much reading around it. Um, but what you describe, you describe it as the mental burn that continues long after being stung mm. from conscious experiences mm. uh, with the white other. Yes. That obviously haven't gone well. Um, and, and I know that feeling. Mm. And it, and it hasn't, hasn't had a word before. It's just sort mm. of, you know, whatever, mm. whatever, whatever. It's just a feeling, you know, mm. that you have. And it has, so you really kind of put a word to something which is very, 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 very important, I think, uh, in our experience. Mm. I mean, what brought you to that concept and um, what made you think, well, actually, I'm going to bring that to the fore because yes. that is actually quite important. Yes. And as you started talking about it, I picked up this book. Uh, it's uh, Hauntings, Psychoanalysis and Ghostly Transmissions by Professor Stephen Frosch. Now, I'll just give you the trajectory, you know, the, the sort of sequence of uh, me coming to that uh, concept. Um, Lorraine, who is in the audience here, uh, is a colleague of mine. She and I were talking about uh, a piece of clinical work. And Lorraine said something like, Uh, 
um, that's like the mother. She said, you know, in, in, in the Caribbean, the mother sometimes say to the little boy who is quite restless, you're haunted by, you're haunted, you're ha you are, are you haunted, my son, my, ba my baby, are you haunted? It's an expression that is used quite commonly in the Caribbean for the child who fidgets and who is restless. I think in the Western society, that child will have ADHD. That's what it will be labeled, ADHD. But we don't know what else is going on in that little boy. And something, that, that conversation that we had was really, uh, really impactful. And so I moved it from the mother and little boy conversation that we had and I just happened to come across Stephen Frosch's work. And it's, he's talking about the same restlessness and this mm -hmm. same almost sort of like agitation. But the way Stephen, Professor Stephen Frosch spoke about it was something completely different. So let me just put a little context to it. Stephen, Professor Stephen Frosch took the concept from I guess the, the, re, the, the first person who really made this concept uh, well known in the psychoanalytic world, mm -hmm. Avery Gordon, Avery Gordon, when she wrote about, about it, when she wrote about it, she wasn't writing about it race specifically. She was just interested in the general concept the general concept. So she didn't sort of put, uh, attach it to any particular racial group. And um, she, uh, she, um, and I, I, I actually had a piece here. She had a very clear idea that um, it was about um, the past always being present, always being present in a very kind of, um, it's almost like a low-level hum, like a low-level hum, a bit like tinnitus, like it's always present, the past always in the present, as a concept. Mm. But S Professor Stephen Frosch spoke about it with regard to the Holocaust mm. and the post-trauma experiences of children mm. of Holocaust survivors and all the generations down. Mm. But he described it as a repression, an unconscious repression. He describes hauntings as an unconscious repression, which I understood you don't talk about it. Mm. It's too painful. It could even be dangerous. Mm. So you'll hear from a lot of Jewish elders, we didn't talk about it. Mm. We didn't talk about it. We, there was a silence. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe not unconscious, but maybe semi-conscious repression. It had to be kept in a safe place. Mm -hmm. So that's what Professor Stephen Frosch wrote about it. Mm -hmm. But he issued a challenge. He mm -hmm. said... When we are, most people, you know, because, you know, you, you, you create a concept, everybody jumps on it. He said, most writers are writing about hauntings in a vertical way, from the original trauma going down the generations, vertical, vertical. But he says, there's a horizontal element to it. Mm -hmm. I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's a horizontal. And I thought that's where the black experience comes in. Because the past has, so I'm going to do a symbol. The, the, the vertical is history going down the generations, down the generations. But the vertical is, it is happening to me today, 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 on a horizontal. It is still happening on a horizontal. So I love this axis, the vertical and the horizontal happening day to day to day. Mm -hmm. And hauntings are when micro and macro aggressions literally trigger us 
And not only do we feel the discomfort of what's just happened to us, but we are somehow catapulted back into the past. I'll give you an example. Is it Charles Q? Is it Charles Q um, who was strip searched? Yeah, Charles Q. Uh, I'll just elaborate for t people who are listening online because they might not know who Charles Q is. Charles Q is a young woman, sorry, a young person, I guess in her uh, adolescent, who was strip searched by uh, police, British police, in 2020, I think it was. And Strip searching is when you're asked to take your clothes off, spread your legs, we're going to uh, run our hands up and down the inside of your bum cheeks, uh, there's internal examination. It is horrible. And that happened to a young person, a young person, a young woman, a young girl. And that happened to her without an appropriate adult present. When I heard that story, as we all heard, there was a trigger, not only of that incident, but I also, it's like my mind went all the way back to the past where slaves were, when they were shipped, and as soon as when they arrived, when they, just, when they came off the ship, and you could imagine the state they were when they came off the ship, they were checked. They had their gum, their, their lips lifted so their gums and so on could be checked. They had their bum cheeks spread. They had, men had their balls weighed to see whether they'll be good studying machines and so on. My mind went back there. And I don't know if my mind went back there because I had my education in the mm. Caribbean, to go back to our early mm. question. Mm informed me about all of that. Mm. I don't know mm. if that's why my mind worked differently, because I, had, I was educated in a black history, Caribbean history. But what I want to say about hauntings is that you just don't think about the incident that a child Q and similar other microaggressions do to an individual. There's an after burn, there's a discomfort, and that discomfort stayed with me for days, for weeks. I was thinking about child Q, I was thinking about her parents, mm. I was thinking about other black girls mm. Mm. and boys. It, it, you, it just doesn't, you just don't focus on the incident, it sort of has a, a kind of a ripple effect that stays with you and that it, it haunts you. It haunts you for quite some time. And I think it's that haunting that builds up in some people who end up in psychiatric hospitals. I really do. I really do. I really do. Hmm. That's too long an answer for the question, but well, we'll, we'll leave it there. Well, <laughs> but it, um, I'm so passionate about really making that clear yeah no i think it i think it needed to be mm. um as well and um mm. you see it showing up showing up all over the place yes you know and yes. And, it, and and um if, even just being with someone you don't necessarily yes. know that yes a story yes a story is almost irrelevant you can yes. feel the haunting coming into you yes it's sort of so it's very it's a very yeah very it's powerful a very concept. powerful yeah. and it's led to uh people uh, coining a concept called adultification, mm. which is the way black and brown children are treated as if they were uh, mature adults. Not like children, adultification. It's a brand new concept. Well, it's been around in the States for a while, but we are always here in the UK a bit late catching up with these concepts. And we can see it often uh, in, in, in our social situation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a little bit of time. Um, and uh, so we'll soon go to the audience and the online audience as well. I wanted to come towards the end of the book because you do give, um, you know, um, yeah, you're interested in healing, yeah, and, and so you, you know, you really write about that. Um, 
So in your final chapter on healing uh, from the burden of heritage, you talk about moving towards a sense of freedom. And again, you unpack that word. It's got so many mm. flavors to it. <laughs> Um, but certainly in the generational context and the black context. Um, how would you summarize this sense of freedom? And has going through the process of writing the book moved you towards that sense of freedom you talk about? It probably, it probably doesn't, uh, you, we don't have enough time probably to do it full justice. <laughs> but um, just, just some thoughts. It's a big topic. That's mm. a big question. You're just great. You've asked some great <laughs> questions. I mean, it's just wonderful. I can tell you this is not the first time you're doing this kind of uh, interviewing. Uh, bloody good questions. Um, let me just let me just sort of pick out a few a few yeah. elements. Um, I think freedom in the context of lifting the burden of heritage is about giving oneself a voice mm. in whatever way mm. you know i happen to do it i mean covid allowed me to do it I'd, if there, i was thinking if it weren't for covid would i have done this and i think the answer would have been no mm. because i would have been faffing about about where am i going to find the time where am i going to find the time mm. so i'm grateful for covid um and i think it's finding expression for what you believe in. Mm. It may be writing, it may be poetry, it may be dancing, it, writing, so, writing music, it may be sculpting, it may be drawing, it, whatever, whatever. It's actualizing that voice in whatever way. Um, I think it's about dealing with wish fulfillments we all we have a saying in Guyana and we laugh at this you know when men say one day one day may go buy a bit of land may go buy a bit of land and you know one day I was all over the Caribbean you know <laughs> one day may go build a big house and you know one day you know because uh, land is called um, brown gold in the Caribbean. One day I'm going to get a couple of acres of land and, you know, uh, have, you know, farm it and be mm. self sufficient. But it feels like a wish fulfillment that never gets fulfilled for some, for some. And I think freedom is about actualizing those. Mm. Mm. Don't go around kidding yourself, don't have a, a romanticized idea mm. with the mm. things that you want to achieve. Mm. Mm. Give it a go. Mm. And defeat the imposter syndrome, mm. uh, the imposter syndrome, mm. that which makes us feel as if we're not good enough. Mm. We're not mm. good enough to defeat that. And to go against the taboos imposed by society that's not for you, society might say. That's not for you. Mm. I'm watching the unfolding events of our new chancellor <laughs> and how, so just to bring a little bit of politics into here, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kwasi Kwateng, how people are relating to a black man handling our purse strings in the UK, uh, to maybe how an Asian man handled the purse strings. You know, lots of stereotypes go on about who can manage uh, particular areas in life imposed by society. So just watch the unfolding events of how that particular individual holds the purse strings. You know, to go against those, to go against those. I, I, I think I'm a bit of a show-off, a bit of a brazen show-off, because at nearly 60, I decided to learn how to ride a bike. And I did. And I passed my test. <laughs> and I immediately bought a bike. And I was riding every weekend with the Harley, Posson, Harley Posse Davidson uh, group. <laughs> every weekend, about six or eight of them yeah. would pull up 
uh, at my house making a racket, <laughs> creating a racket. And I would get dressed and I'd go riding around the twisty, bendy lanes of East and West Sussex on my little baby Holly, you know, uh, and doing lots of other sports like uh, mm. hand gliding. <laughs> You've done hand gliding. Not hand gliding, zip lining. Oh, zip lining. Zip lining okay, you know, all sort of crazy <laughs> yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Sword fencing, you know, yeah, yeah. because you're, that's not for you. Yes, yes. That's yes. not for you. Black, yeah. pe black people don't do that. They don't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do that. <laughs> you need to post some of that on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Little helmet. <laughs> yeah. Breaking, breaking, uh, breaking the mold. Um, yeah. Break, breaking the mold, breaking, breaking the mold. The mold. Yeah. And I'm asking everyone to do that mm. in their own way. Do it. Mm. Your, do what you want to do. No, remove all the prohibitions. Remove all the, you know, I can't. Oh, that's not for me. Remove all of that and just dare, dare yourself, dare yourself. Mm -hmm. Just want to finish off by um, talking about the end. There's um, there's an afterword. You've got a sort of section at the end of the book after all of the main bit. Oh yes. You talk a little bit about you know the stuff you've been doing yes. uh, to de-stress yourself. Yes. Including poetry, and um, so you, there's a few poems you have at the back of the <laughs> book. Um, they're written by you, and I thought it would be fantastic to hear one. Oh my goodness. I've never done feel, that. Feel up for it. Dare yourself. Oh, anyone in the room? Is anyone in the room a good poet, uh, a, a reader of poetry? Because, you. yes. Because I thought I thought I, I thought I would read it, but then I thought actually, when you hear the, po uh, the person who's written oh, the poem, oh my gosh, read it, it's a very different thing. It's a whole oh my goodness, you, uh, oh, uh, I can do that. They're going to read it anyway, so. <laughs> do you know I've never done something like this, and I haven't written poetry before. We have a poet laureate in uh, Lewis. I, I live near Brighton. I used to live in East Dulwich for over 30 years. And I live in, uh, near Brighton in New Haven, a hop and a skip from the seafront. Wonderful, wonderful. And next, next door, Lewis, is our, our, our poet laureate, uh, John Agard. John Agard. And um, I go to... Uh, the evenings, poetry evenings, and uh, he's Guyanese, by the way, and I listened to him and I was thinking, I can't do that, I can't do that. But when I was writing this book as a way of relaxing, because I live nearby the sea and I watch the sea, this stuff came to me. So I'm going to read, mm. um, I'm going to read, uh, um, I'm going to read um, one of them, The Trials of Belonging Here. The trials of belonging here. Let's put these glasses on. These are better. Um, oh, that's better. Ooh, I've never done this before. I don't, how is it going to sound? I don't know. Okay, here we go. My father... It's called Trials of Belonging Here. My father told me to go to England. It is the mother country, he said. I believed his words to mean that's where you'll work and earn good bread. So I traveled to the UK to make here my bed and engage in a good profession that allowed me to get ahead. Leaving Heathrow for the first time about 46 years ago, I'm struck by the strange houses I see are these the English abodes where people sit and drink tea? They look like factories to me, all joined up in rows with chimneys billowing smoke amidst the grey atmosphere and winter snow. White people flash bright smiles 
lips contract as quickly as they appear. Are they being genuine or is it something they fear? Such strange behavior leaves me perplexed. Did I make a mistake or was I making them vexed? It's difficult to know, so I keep my head low and focus on my career. I study and work as a nurse, first bathing white bodies, then tending to their minds. Some react nev negatively, as though I had no right to such intimate finds. Professionals ask, how come you speak so perfect English? Your grammar doesn't match with what we see. Who does this alien think she is? Some overseas imposter or a colonial devotee. I question the claim, we are very accommodating. It's ridiculously hard to reconcile such paradoxes in my own contemplating. I quickly realize to remain grounded in an environment where the experience is constantly being confounded, that I'd have to work three times as hard not to feel mentally hounded. I also realize there is no need to engage in constant apology when I can make sense and understand my own ontology. Being black is not my raison d'etre, for I'm tired of being just a color. My existence is not to please or appease, but seize the opportunity to be my own devotee, shining and delighting in my own luminescence. Thank you. How was that? That was good. That was good. That was good. That was very good. Yes. Oh, I enjoyed that. A <laughs> <laughs> oh, time for a few, uh, so we can engage a free for all discussion. John O'Reilly, many congratulations, Aileen. Um, I look forward to receiving my copy tomorrow. Oh. Mm. Um, Tilka, I think it's Ja. Um, Tulika Jar. Yeah. It has been such a wholesome experience working with Dr. Aileen. Even the most painful of experiences were born through smiles, giggles, and her humming a Bollywood tune, <laughs> asking me to give her name of a singer. Give me. Um, another one. Um, one can only imagine having a relationship with this and, and their therapist and also collaborate with them as equals. So that's uh, Tulsa again. Um, Tulika, uh, doc, Dr. Tulika, Tulika yeah. Mm. Uh, Stuart Taylor, second book from Aileen? Yes. Um. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I've got the bug. <laughs> uh, formative experiences in Africa or the Caribbean and their impact on black identity formation in relation to the experience of African diaspora, diaspora and folk giving up in the West under the scrutiny of the white gaze. Okay, it's quite a lot there. Um, uh, Tuluka again, spooky how I have just spoken about this Eugene, joy and laughter. I think that might have been something in our conversation, but I didn't catch that. Uh, Aisha Mackenzie Mavinga. Hi, Aisha. Um, greeting from Tobago and good wishes to Aileen on her book launch and this auspicious event. I feel blessed to have been on the journey with you. I am with you in spirit and wish you could share the Guyanese treats. <laughs> Which, yeah. uh, would love to know what drink you were taking in that libation. <laughs> enjoy the day. Elder, and enjoy, yeah, enjoy the sun. Just tell her uh, Eldorado rum. Eldorado. Eldorado Guyanese rum. Eldorado yes, Guyanese yes, rum, yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and just the last thing here from uh, Josephine. Can you let us have the name and title of the book you mentioned by Professor Stephen Frosch about hauntings? And um, that is... Uh, Hauntings, Psychoanalysis and Ghostly Transmissions by Professor Stephen Frosch. And Frosch is spelled F R 
O S H. Thank you. Okay. Um, Shall we have some uh, some thoughts, questions, reflections from the audience? We have someone in the second row. <laughs> I, I actually only wanted to say thank you. You are both, actually. I wanted to thank you both for such incredible contributions. And it feels really precious to see two black psychotherapists who've published these amazing texts. And it feels really significant that you're centering the whole construct of race around trauma because that's what it is, and I just don't think we've had enough recognition of that. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, while you're pondering, um, uh, Sinead Blackwood. I'm not sure if you know. Do you know Sinead Blackwood? Yes. Uh, Well done, Aileen. Uh, My my younger brother, aged 11, and I brought your book for my mum for her birthday. Um, He suggested uh, a book around self-love and healing, and I felt your book was a perfect fit, Mm. having worked with you previously. Keep thriving. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Eileen. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I haven't read it yet. And um, but just going back to some of the conversation um, when you and Eugene were speaking about the difference of maybe being born here or coming here early mm-hmm. as an immigrant versus coming a little later. Uh, I was reminded of, um, I'm, I'm training as a psychotherapist, and there's around nine people in the year. Mm-hmm. At the Guild. At the Guild. So two of us are uh, people of colour and about six white people. And we were asked at one uh, of the seminars, you know, when did we first remember thinking about the concept of race or coming across the concept of race. And the six white people, pretty much all of them said around the age of nine, 10, 11. And the two people of color, including me, it was around the age of two. And uh, the people who came across it, six, eight, nine, 11, came across it as a kind of curiosity they were kind of curious about this difference. Mm-hmm. For me and this other colleague who were uh, people of color, we came across it as an act of violence. Uh, we remember being feeling hurt or, 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 or attacked in some way in, in the playground. Mm-hmm. So I think the, um, this difference, uh, Beyond says something in his paper on not knowing. Yes. He talks about the difference between knowing and knowing about. Yes. And one might know about the effects of violence, but it's very different from knowing it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wanted to offer that as a thought on that early part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's giving me food for thought. Mm. Got um, Jabril here at the front. Congratulations again. Thank you. I just wanted to um, comment on your grandparents' uh, comment on the um, astronaut thing. It's, um, it reminded me of um, a program I heard recently about black people can't swim because their bones are too dense mm. and um, how dangerous that is for a, a, a black person who can't swim. And so it's, you know, it's, it has that aspect to it. But also, I don't know, can't blame the, the grandparents wholeheartedly for the comment because they're, they're, they're colonial, sure. and, you know, in their, sure. their background. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Yes, it's, um, it's really important that you, we hold both sides. Different genera- We're talking generational issues here. Um, and one can't blame a generation for the way in which they hold their view about the world. Um, uh, but I can still own my how shaming it was. Mm. Hi, Lorraine. Hi. Um, thank you. Just thank you, Eileen, and, and thank you for your words and the time that you've taken to put that in this book and um, and the libation. There's just so much today. I feel nourished on so many levels, but it was just that thing about um, not being able to, to 
to access that dream, but how that burden has actually, in my mind, has been your rocket fuel. It's like it, you have taken that and you've composted it and you are, you've become that astronaut in a way. I mean, just <laughs> as you were talking, I was like, but she's, she's going there. She is, she's got the rocket fuel. You're doing the bike, you're doing the gliding. And it's just so inspiring. And that's, that's what I want to say, that, that there is something um, that, that gets kind of, I suppose, I'm getting quite emotional because this is so, um, this is just so moving for me. But yes, just something that gets composted, that we can move through something. It doesn't mean that we forget, but we don't have to stare back at it, you know, that we can move through it. And um, yeah, I just wish you every success. And I hope you write another book as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much. It's been really inspiring. Um, it just feels like you've just started talking about it and there's just could be so much more. And I just think, podcast, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eileen, thank you. And I just want to also honour your teaching. I'm During COVID, I was really sustained by your teaching through CONFA and it really sort of shattered me and it was just so informative for me. But the question I have, I've learned a lot about, um, this is this sort of conversation has helped um, as also I've drawn on, on sort of contemporary African um, fiction and, and Caribbean fiction. And I was just wondering, um, as a clinician, what, um, how, how you might, if, if indeed, but how you use, because I think this, for me, it was so helpful, the sort of spiritual perspectives on, I think, the unique experience of women who've experienced um, mental illness and, and how that's sometimes interpreted and described in some of these wonderful books I read. But also, this, so thinking about the hauntings. But I mean, how how do you work with spirituality, and is it possible to work creatively with the sort of history of w w if, say, clients um, are aware of a, a sort of ancestral suffering in terms of mental illness? How how might you do? You think it's safe to work with that kind of creatively and that sort of that perspective? I think it is safe to work with it, but it has to be a collaborative effort. You know, because the word spirituality means so many different things to so many of us. I mean, may I ask what spirituality means to you? Because right in that question, if we were working together, that would be my first question. You know, because I really want to hear what it means to the other person. Yeah, I, I, I just need some time to think about it. I suppose I was just thinking a bit about the um, um, what I've understood from, from these works is around sort of certain myths and traditions which draw on um, Christianity, but also specific to the mm -hmm. area, yeah. you know. So, so there's sort of, the, there's, but there's certainly this very powerful... Yes, um, yes. But, yeah. Again, it comes back, to, thank you very much. I think it comes back to what it means to different people. I have some colleagues who would describe themselves as working from an Afrocentric perspective. And in just very small ways, when a client comes into the consulting room, they might light a candle. I don't work that way. Um, not that I say, see it as being, you know, wrong, but it's what different people mean, interpret and embrace as their spirituality. Um, you know, some uh, Afrocentric therapists will work with drums and so on to enable expression, as in the Eurocentric way, it would be a six sheets of paper with pens and you know it, it's a, it's all different but i think when i work with spirituality i think it's some kind of inner sense within the person some kind of inner guiding principle that needs to be reawakened and you know sort of become more active within the individual it's some kind of inner in a, in a driving force. Uh, that's what I th really think about if I'm ready to sort of put a statement on it. it. It's so... 
intersectional. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to go to some of the people online and then um, we'll take some from here. Um, Stuart Taylor, will you be offering some workshops based on your book, perhaps later this autumn um, or even early <laughs> next year? <laughs> Maybe don't answer that one right now. I've all, uh, I've, I, I will. Um, yeah. I've already done a workshop on the internal oppressor, which is a concept that I've been working mm. on and I've written in other papers. Yes. I did uh, that for WPF, the Westminster Pastoral Foundation, and I think somebody who was present uh, there, she's here today, yes. Um, so, I um, yes, I will be doing. I, I like to impart knowledge, uh, but also to facilitate uh, discourse. Mm -hmm. I'm always curious to learn more. Um, I'm greedy in that way, uh, to learn more from other people. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'll just continue here. Um, Rachel Towney, thank you for writing this book. What are your thoughts about intergenerational racial trauma? And do you think that this can be resolved? If so, how? I guess your book is sort of one step. Um, uh, can I just say yeah. one sentence? Yeah. I think healing generational trauma is a lifelong pursuit. I don't think we ever arrive. It's so, a maybe so, maybe even the generational. Maybe pursuit. your yeah. children's children. Yeah. You know, something gets washed out in the rinses. You mm. know, when you go through, a, if you rinse. You do rinsing. By the time you get to that rinse over there, it's just a little bit of color mm. or nothing at all. I think it'll come out in the rinse, mm -hmm. the generational rinse. I've just coined a term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mona Lisa, um, very inspirational. Thank you very much, Aileen and Eugene. I can't wait to read the book. Um, Nolan Hudson, thanks. Anonymous, do you have any thoughts on Dr. DeGru Dr. Joy DeGruy's work on post-traumatic slave syndrome? Well, you do, because you did a presentation on it. Didn't you? And I, in, yeah. I, I include her work in my book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very valid. Very and I valid. think Confer have a, a, yes. Have a, a yes. video yes. Um, um, workshop yeah. available on that. Yes. Um, Philip uh, Giorgio, how lucky I feel. So, how lucky I feel to have had you as my supervisor and dear friend for so many years. We've had many, many laughs together, and it's great to see you sharing your wisdom and humour too with this audience. Keep breaking the mould. Thank you for being you. Congratulations. I can't wait for a copy to arrive here in Beirut. Phil, uh, love Phil. Phil Giorgio uh, is uh, one of my favourite people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll take a question in here. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, I uh, was your first question about uh, where you spend your formative years just really, mm. really landed with me. Um, I grew up in East Dulwich. Um, I went to primary school in the village. And I was really struck by when you said um, that a phrase you said about people saying, don't you speak well? I was answering that question or receiving that comment since the age of four. Mm. Um, and 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 having to hold quite adult concepts from a very young age. I mm. mean, um, as a drama therapist and embodied psychotherapist now, my work is always about that kind of idea of sense of self mm -hmm. within the history of Britain. Mm. I had a really strong sense of my Jamaican heritage because my granddad made it his business to tell me not only the history but how it aligned for my place to be here. Yes. Um, but that was almost, like, I call mm. it the secret history. It was one that I worked, you know, that was in part not in school. Mm. Um, so that really landed. You were in your teens. I was six, five, six, and having that. Um, and you mentioned these hauntings that you said maybe come, you come across within um, people of the diaspora, within mental, within mental health. And I too witnessed that when I was working in forensics. Mm -hmm. I call it the low-level hum, like the low-level grief. The low-level hum. It's the grief. This and I now mm. my practice now. I work alongside actors. Mm. I'm trained as an actor, and I work alongside actors now mm. because when I first had to be a, an enslaved person, 
there was something I just I couldn't describe within mm -hmm. my body mm -hmm. that was happening. Yes. And it took so then as a therapist now that's where so I I agree there is that that low level grief that yes. hum that yes. whisper yes. of before yes um, that is is so present and I really feel as um, when I was training and as it's not addressed mm. as how do I know it as my own lived experience mm -hmm. but someone that doesn't look mm. like me mm -hmm. as a therapist how do you go in and hear that hum yes. And hold that hum yes. and not offend that hum and have compassion for that hum because mm. those are the things it needs because mm. it's never had those. Mm -hmm. It's been told its nostrils yes. are too big or, you know, ingest or whatever. Yes. And I think that that conversation needs to happen in training. And you've written a chapter in a book which is out, out there in, in, the, in the foyer. What's the name of that book? Um, Intersectionality in Psychoart Therapies. And I've written it about yeah. colonialised attachment because I was in a FATAG conference and was just one of three yes. uh, uh, art therapists, I'm a drama therapist, that wasn't white. Yes. And was the, our clients, our patients were being discussed and I kind of pulled away and thought, mm -hmm. if we took the context out, mm -hmm. this felt, this felt yes. really yes. uncomfortable yes. and could have been in any period of time hundreds of years before. Yes. And I felt that my aim as a drama therapist was to go in and try and Com hold compassion for the hum mm -hmm. to reparent with someone that looked like their parents holding the compassion for the hum yeah wonderful title could you just say your book chapter again um yes it's the book is called um oh gosh i always forget that's my stuff lol uh, <laughs> and, and say, it, say it slowly for people mm -hmm. um intersectionalities in psycho art therapies um it's got a series of different um chapters in it my chapter is mm -hmm. um colonized attachment from a drama pre therapy perspective but from a jamaican perspective mm -hmm. um because i believe parenting is taught by our foremothers at some point mm -hmm. my foremothers were enslaved mm -hmm. and what was a secure attachment for them you know yes so, yeah Wonderful. i think i this book and this these talks are so important mm -hmm. because they're not being had in training mm -hmm. yeah. you yeah. know i'm three years out but it i was appalled by what the fact that i was secure attachment wasn't being considered from the world mm. Mm, mm, mm. and what it what secure attachment in one place isn't secure attachment in another mm, and let's mm. look at that and how we hold that yeah so thank you you're welcome you're welcome thank you welcome. thank you very much yeah um uh, uh wabria spelt w-a-b-r-i-y-a uh so then king k-i-n-g yeah, so someone in the audience just asked for your, your, the name of the person who last spoke, so just to, for the um, audience at, uh, online. Um, just a few questions, a few more comments. Um, Abby Kanipa Anson, um, I wonder what you think is the role of psychotherapy in regards to healing of the vertical and horizontal haunti hauntings. You talked about it briefly when you said freedom to actualize your dreams. Is, psychother is psychotherapy got that role? Sorry. Does psychotherapy have that role? Psychotherapy definitely has the role to do that because I see psychotherapy as enabling people to achieve and actualize and transform. So it definitely has that role. Mm -hmm. But we have to work with uh, ways of understanding others' worlds and the wounds that they bring with them yeah. ancestrally, because those do have an impact on the transformation process. Mm. You know, and if the goal of all therapies is to integrate, uh, integration, mm. uh, integration warts and all, the wart, if you like, is the generational wound, mm. that has to be integrated. Mm. It has to be integrated. It has to be integrated. So I think everything that we're doing here is about informing psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, counselling. It's all about informing. Mm. And the audience, which is quite mixed, many of you are psychotherapists or counsellors, drama therapists. Um, you will be passing that on. Uh, uh, tutors, um, you'll be passing that on. So, you know, it's all happening. It's, yeah, it's yeah. active. But I would like more people to write. 
Mm-hmm. Please, right, right, right. Um, Georgina Evans. Hello, Georgina. Um, dear Aileen, thank you for your book and your invaluable inspiration to all of us to tell your story or tell our stories. Thank you. Um, Philip um, Braham. Thank you, Aileen. Eugenia wondered about your thoughts of the impact of trauma on those with mixed black, African and white European heritage. Um, That's a big one. We've got Mm. not that long. (laughs) Um, And it's that's an area that I feel more need to be written about in the psychotherapy world. Does. Some of the, the literature that's there, it's a bit old, yeah. but we need more people to write who are of mixed heritage, yeah. mixed race or biracial, whichever terminology, uh, dual heritage, whichever terminology you yeah. feel fits yeah. you, or person of color, um, you know, a BIPOC uh, individual, you know, it, 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 that, that literature needs expansion yes. Yes. because I think the issues for people who straddle both sides are very different, mm. very different. Yes. Uh, there's sometimes a sense of not, not belonging anywhere. Mm. On the black side, the white side, there's a sense of not belonging. And I mean, I, I work with individuals who are in that space. Yes. Um, Mm. It has its own flavor of it has trauma. its own flavor no, not, yeah. Yeah. yeah it has its own flavor of yeah. trauma yeah. it's multi-layered because they yeah. can feel the hurt from yeah. the black side from the white yeah. side from history yeah. you know it's coming from all different is, yeah. at the in, you're there almost like at the intersection mm. of uh, um, the 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 um in the uh, the, 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 the picture mm. and we have to cr- use an intersectional lens in which to understand people of mixed heritage, their position and their struggles and their their challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all we have time for. There's never enough time. Good, good, good. Um, good. There's some more comments online, which you can read uh, later, I'm sure. Um, We've come to the end of our time. And thank you. Thank you, Aileen.